This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. My name is Rob Bullock and I'd like to fill up the chair of our session, I am a publisher. And I am from Yale University Press in London, a press that publishes a good deal of history, but no fiction, at least not no. <laughs> <laughs> Over the past 24 hours, <coughs> last evening, we've had an invigorating, eye-opening and occasionally alarming look at what historical fiction is, what it does, how it's written, the techniques and principles of three, really three of the most successful current practitioners, the consistent popularity of historical fiction in the marketplace and what connects it and sets it apart from academics. Now we come to the issue of its effects and consequences. Does historical fiction benefit or threaten academic history? Does it complement or does it undermine scholarly research-based narrative and its readers. In a way, that this issue has been hanging over us throughout the day, uh, and indeed Justin Champion and uh, Beverly Southgate have touched on it at their earlier session. Now, to explore the issue head-on, as it were, we have a diverse and very accomplished panel. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce them all at once, and then they'll give their presentation. Uh, on my left, Jackie Eels, is Professor of Early Modern History at Canterbury and Christ Church University, <coughs> and also the new, or relatively new, Jackie, I think, uh, President of the Historical Association, which is the institution that represents the broadest range of historians across the country. She is a 16th and 17th century specialist, now focusing on the English Civil Wars, um, but has also written on women's history, and the history of Kent. She has also written on the letters of Lady Brilliana Harvey, which sounds to me to be deserving of a gold foil blocked jacket. <laughs> Cora Kaplan has taught at Sussex, at Rutgers, and at Southampton University, and is now honorary professor in the School of English and Drama at Queen Mary University of London. She is a feminist critic and theorist, and among her recent works is Victoriana, History's Fiction Criticism. It's a book about our obsession with the Victorian period and the ways in which we rework it and represent it in books and films. Paul Day, as you know, chaired the opening session last evening. Uh, Paul was one of the founders of the BBC History magazine and, his, and its deputy editor, and he's now editor of History Today, which seems to me a crossing of the floor of Churchillian proportions. <laughs> Paul writes, reviews, broadcasts, and indeed lobbies widely and very effectively on the behalf of history in its broadest context, context. Among his books is one that has endeared him to me. It's called Real Italian Food. <laughs> Stella Tilliard is a writer and scholar who, like Cora, has lived in both and taught in both Britain and the United States and is probably best known for Aristocrats, a marvellous biography of the four Lenin <coughs> sisters. Uh, the book was published in 1994 and turned into a masterpiece theatre television series in 2000. This year, Stella published her first novel, Tides of War, which deals with the period of the Peninsular War. And among the many glowing reviews was one in the Financial Times by Lucy Kelleway, who said the novel made her want to slip between the pages and become a character in the book, something she'd not felt since reading Jane Austen. With that slightly erotic thought playing around, I think we should begin. We have an hour and a quarter, so I've asked the speakers to keep scrupulously to their erotic 15 minutes, enabling us to have a few questions and points from the floor afterwards. So, Jackie first. Thank you very much. I've got a confession to make. I'm not writing a historical novel. And I think I must be in the minority. But just listening to other panelists and everybody talking, I began to think about the way in which I write history, what do I actually do when I write history. 
And I'm very conscious of the facts, I think all academic historians are, that they are selective about their sources, they're selective about how they boil them down to analyse and write their history. I'm also conscious as I'm writing that I can move the material around, I can juxtapose it in different ways, and that I actually have creative control over it, which in some ways I suppose is akin to what a novelist <coughs> or a writer of historical fiction might do with their material. So I think that in some respect we might be setting up a dichotomy between the two genres of writing and antagonism almost, but I think in fact they're much closer to together than we might realise. I think historians aren't naive about the idea of the established historical fact. I think Ian was talking about that earlier. I think we're well aware that some facts perhaps are established that somebody died, certainly, but what went on around it, perhaps that particular death, might be open to question. But I wanted to talk um, more generally about the relationship between historical fiction and academic history. And the question posed is, does the one threaten the other? And I think the answer is certainly not. We've already heard a little about sharp novels from Ian. Uh, whenever I interview prospective undergraduates who want to come and study history at my university, I always ask them the same question. I say, what history book are you reading at the moment? And out of every group, there will always be one prospective student who says, oh, I'm reading a sharp novel. <laughs> And it's actually drawn them into wanting to find out more about history. Now, that's great. I think historical fiction does exactly that. It draws people in. It makes people want to find out more about history in a variety of ways. It might be studying history at university. It might be picking up a book by an academic historian or a book of popular history. And I think that's a very good thing. But there are some things that worry me about that answer. First of all, why is it always sharp? <laughs> Why isn't it some other novelist? I'd rather they had a wider remit of reading. And the other one is that there is a mismatch between the question and the answer. When sitting in an academic historian's office and being asked what history book are you reading, I'm surprised when I get the answer that it's a novel. And I think this is because that for all of us, not just the prospective undergraduate, not just the young, there's a penumbra of ideas that are meshed together and they comprised of fact, historical fact, fiction, myth, misunderstanding. And it's very difficult for all of us to pull those apart. After all, we all know that Alfred burnt the cakes. We all know that Elizabeth the first made that tremendous speech <coughs> saying that she had the body of a weak and feeble woman, but the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. Do we? The first evidence for that particular ringing speech comes from 1626. So it's not contemporary, but we know that she made a speech and she probably said something along those lines. So I think for all of us, there's this kind of element of myth and story, and we find it difficult to pick them apart. And I was thinking about what I wanted to say this afternoon, and I was thinking about the first history book I can remember reading as a child. I had a very clear memory of this uh, book, and it was about the four ladies in waiting to Mary, Queen of Scots. And it was called The Four Maries, and it was a very exciting history book. It had all sorts of things that would appeal to children. And I think that's exactly the sort of thing that draws very young children in to want to find out more about history. And this book in particular had tragedy, it had romance, it had exotic locations like Scotland, <laughs> France. So it's absolutely right that I was reading that at that particular age. But I wouldn't have been able to distinguish what was fact and what was perhaps elaborated story to make that more exciting for a popular readership. I can also remember reading Captain Marriott's The Children of the New Forest when I was a bit older. And I took that book off my shelf uh, just before I came here to have another look at it. It was written in the 1840s. Fantastic book. It starts off with a paragraph which is absolutely accurate about the English Civil War and then goes on to tell the story of the children of a royalist uh, who is men children are menaced by round-head soldiers who are trying to capture the father. And I think that that kind of um, fiction can raise all sorts of interesting questions, for children in particular, that historians can't deal with readily. Questions of morality, questions of cruelty, and so on. And I must admit to having a vested interest in talking about children's fiction, because as president of the Historical Association, the association has an annual 
prize competition each year for the best historical fiction for children. <coughs> Last year, uh, the prize went to Jacqueline Wilson for her novel Petty Feather. And that is a prize uh, that is chosen by a panel of young readers. It's not adults making that decision for them. It's uh, a panel of young children who are reading the books and saying which one they particularly like. And Hetty Feather also deals with some of these moral questions and issues that I think academic historians would find it very difficult to raise, especially if they're addressing history for children. Uh, Hetty Feather is the central character, the heroine. She is brought up in a foundling hospital in an institution. So again, it raises all of these very delicate issues for children about legitimacy, about adults treating children with contempt because they're illegitimate, about life in an institution for a child in the past and so on. But I think that historians can't necessarily deal with. And the Historical Association has got a long track record of thinking about historical fiction. I was lucky enough to come across uh, one of the Historical Association general pamphlets uh, from 1961 by Helen Cam when I was thinking about what I wanted to say this afternoon. And it's called Historical Novels. And uh, Helen Cam, great medieval historian, was uh, writing about the state of the historical novel when she was writing in 1961. And there's a great roundup here. If anybody ever wants to write a history of the historical novel, this would be a great place to start because it's got a great list and a great roundup of uh, the state of play at the time. And she makes some very interesting points in this pamphlet. She says that there's a generally high standard of fiction today, so she was writing in 1961, historical fiction, and she attributes that to the fact that history itself had widened its remit. She attributes it to the widening of the field of history, research in archaeology and anthropology, in social and economic history, and I think you could link that to the boom in universities in the post-war era, and especially the boom in social history, social and economic history. So that Historical fiction writers are able to draw on a much wider range of history, as Cam was writing, but even today, as we've heard today, when historians are starting to push into new areas and new, push against new boundaries to look at histories of emotion, laughter, all sorts of things that wouldn't have been dreamt of 30 or 40 years ago in academic circles. Now, Cam concludes um, at the very end that the best type of historical fiction has to keep to certain rules. And remember, she was, she was writing untroubled uh, by theories about um, postmodernism or Marxist theories about historical fiction. And she says that the best sort of historical fiction must be compatible with what she calls the temper of the age, and it must also be compatible with the established facts of history. And I think that's a very rigid definition. I think that most historians would admit that they don't really know what the temper of the age was in the past. They might approximate it, but they know that they're not really going to recapture it accurately. As for the established facts, again, we are dealing with fiction. As Ian said earlier, there's the ability with fiction to play with facts, to change things, to make them different, to create a kaleidoscope of different patterns. And I don't think academic historians should be too precious about that. Uh, we are sometimes rather sensitive and rather precious about the way in which our precious facts, which we've gone down into the salt mines to discover, might be distorted or changed by other writers. I don't think we should be. What I think we should be doing as historians and academics is playing with forms, as we heard in the previous panel, we should be playing with what we do. Um, but I particularly think that we ought to be moving into a form that I don't think we've discussed very fully yet, and that is popular history. Because popular history is an area where a lot of the myths perhaps are perpetuated, but where a lot of academic historians have actually made some very good, very important contributions. I'm thinking here of Lisa Jardine's book on the assassination of William of Orange, Alec Ryrie's book about the magician and the sorcerer, uh, but also the work of Jim Sharp. Jim's written a couple of what I would regard as more popular histories. Uh, one about the gunpowder plot, uh, which a lot of historians have actually tackled, but the other one about Dick Turpin, and I think that's a great subject, it's a great book, and it's one of those books where it does iron out some of the myths, some of that penumbra attached to a rather shady historical figure, but you can actually turn around and say, now, here's Jim Sharp's book on the same subject, 
and we can tease out some of the myths and some of the facts. So I think historians shouldn't be at all wary or nervous about historical fiction. They shouldn't be wary of other historical forms. If they can push against the uh, boundaries of academic writing in their own historical academic writing, that's all good. And I think what we're seeing is an unprecedented, unprecedented appetite and interest in history and history writing. I think academic historians are benefiting from that in the sense that we are getting undergraduates who want to study history, but we also have an audience for our own work as well, um, which is perhaps more open to the idea of popular history. So I think we should embrace historical writing in all of its forms. Thank you. So many rabbits running around the room, I'm surprised you're not all jumping up. And so, so many of them have been set, but now one often feels one's, what one really wants to do is jump with your text and comment on what you looking before, but I won't do that. Um, I'm sure we'll come to it in the discussion. Reading historical fiction in my teens in the buttoned up politically reactionary environment of the 1950s, uh, Annie Seaton's Catherine, published in 1954, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, 1936 was less a soft introduction to serious history than an education in desire. Both Seton's well-researched story of John of Gaunt's mistress and Mitchell's pro-South racist account of the American Civil War, but she had done a lot of research for that also, were upmarket bodice strippers, we might say. Well-written page turners, both still in print and selling well today out on Amazon, uh, with women protagonists who were tough, sexy, and vulnerable by turns. There's something as I've argued elsewhere, about custom sets that boost the erotic, erotic content of fiction, as if the reader were watching fascinated through a keyhole in time in some, watching some forbidden parental scene. The history, or the historical, provided the mise-en-scene for the romance and the eroticism. It was a necessary element of these novels for me, uh, but at 14 or 15, not part, I think, properly of an historical education. As a child of a left-wing historian and critic, I was fully aware that Mitchell's version of the war between the states was skewed and reactionary, but I didn't much care. Indeed, it added for me a Philip of the Forbidden to read a book so frowned upon at home. Uh, um, in retrospect, of course, I would want to say that these novels appealed because, in certain ways, they anticipated a feminist focus on absolute aspects of lives hidden from history. And I'm sure that's in part true. Uh, but before the full flowering of social history in later decades, the historical novel was the place to find the everyday domestic side of history. But I think these are later rationalizations of my, uh, of my <laughs> adolescent <laughs> pleasures. <laughs> Sexual desire is not the only thing historical novels offer to young readers. Howard Fast's radical biofiction, Citizen Tom Payne in 1943, made political desire utopian, selfless, ambitions, sensuous, and effective. Pain was a lifetime hero for me, but no stretch of the imagination, even for the hormonally charged imagination of adolescence, could make him sexy. And historian Marion Starkey's The Devil in Massachusetts, somewhere between popular history and fiction, which told the story of the Salem witch trials, like Arthur Miller's The Crucible, drawing analogies to the witch hunting 50s, but with an emphasis on little girls and women, did, and badly girls and women as well, did in more direct ways fire both my political and historical imagination, leading me back to biography and straight history, feeling a desire, only partially realized, to become an historian, uh, but also to start querying the sometimes problematic relationship between history with all its biases and provisions, um, <coughs> which are part of what makes it living, a living thing, um, and the fictions which depended on it. Going back before Mitchell, for example, to explore the rewriting of the Civil War in fiction in the 1890s, a grim decade of lynching and repression for black Americans in the South. Uh, the conjunctures which produce revisionist history, I want to argue, revisions of settled historical arguments and historical fictions, both deserve attention today more urgently than ever. Uh, Hilary Mantel said something I thought that would be very fascinating, and which I agree with, is that now you have to write, the however you do it, and however much it's hidden, the historiographical novel. 
Um, and I think that, but I think that also <coughs> means doing something which which she actually resisted in her talk last night, uh, which is to talk about the politics of the novel and the situation of the novelist within that politics. So I actually would want to add to the writing of the historiographical novel that the reader, the writer, the moment is always neck deep in its own current history. Uh, and that history is always part of what, what happens for the reader and the writer of an historical fiction as it is for the writer of history itself. Um, if, as your Lukács in the historical novel argued, Scott's novels, um, he, he argued that Scott's novels were the paradigmatic origin of the form, uh, um, they're, they're actually, they weren't, the, they weren't exactly the origin. Diana Wallace um, wrote a letter in to, um, to Perry Anderson's piece in the, in the London Review of Books, saying, of course, there were many, uh, many historical novels in the 18th century written by women. Um, but what, what Lukács argues is, is that, they, that the historical novel staged a tragic contest between declining and ascending forms of such a life that honors losers but praises the historical necessity of winners. And that's Anderson's gloss uh, on Lukács and Arise in this, in this LRB essay. But if, if we take that as a kind of model of the historical novel of the past, then of course Vanity Fair and Tale of Two Cities historical fiction from the mid-19th century, almost but don't quite fit this model. The social and political outcomes of these novels resist and complicate those binaries. Although the emergence of a conservative with a small c social order, a dominant British social order, desired by the late 1840s and 1850s, is triumphant. Another kind of view of the historical novel by the critic Frederick Jameson is that the historical novel is a kind of melodrama, a battle between good and evil, very theatrical, stage, uh, uh, stage. And I thought it was interesting, again, what Mantel said about one critic saying that a place of greater sa safety was a performance on the stage uh, of, uh, of a scene which was the way the French Revolution exists in history. Uh, so there's a kind of performative aspect to that. One of the problems of historical fiction is in its development of forms of interiority. Uh, and not all historical fiction uh, decides to do this, but great net much of it does. And its detail of social and cultural life, it often sees its task as filling in what we don't know and can never know with imagined content. Drawn uh, from new cultural material, social political history, of course, creating story, agency, voice. Um, social historians in the social history movement, Thompson, E.P. Thompson and Raphael Samuel, Catherine Holland and Davidoff, Sheila Robotham, and hosts of others come to mind, are interested in doing that too. Uh, so I don't think there's a competition, but there's a, there's a kind of relationship between social history from the 1960s onwards and its flowering and the development of the historical novel. I think they go hand in hand. Uh, often they do see themselves as slightly at odds. Um, so, um, but they, but but what he stopped, but the historians want to do it within the rules of their profession, uh, as to evidence and argument. In historical writing, what we cannot know what is lost, what is left out. For example, uh, Brit Britain's complicity with slavery, long complicity with slavery and its legacy uh, in current forms, as opposed to the narrative. That, that is nationally preferred, even up to 2007 and beyond, of the glorious history of abolition. The oppressive side of empire, not just its supposedly civilizing mission. The less salubrious traces and legacies of Victorianism, which are still with us, should be as important as gaps as what can be retrieved. You know, what is silent, what kind of story is being told, is always, already political. And it's political in different ways, for different moments of reading. So if we take Mary Renault's novel now um, in, in, in a world uh, in which there's, you know, it, um, you know in, in which even most repressive countries are repealing their laws against some, uh, some of their laws against homosexuality. Uh, you read those novels differently at this particular moment. You can't help but doing that. Um, a critical the, the exposure of differences of interpretation of evidence are as fascinating as a joined up story. A critical or interrogative approach to history, we've talked about that a lot, 
um, should be what even the common reader, not just the official student, should cultivate in the historical novel. And I remain a firm and fan of the genre, especially but not only in its post-World War II incarnations, of which, of course, there are many stagings and even at the present many varieties. Um, well, Anderson, following Jameson, points without much enthusiasm for the postmodern forms of the historical novel, its syncopated non-realist forms, and we've talked about that uh, a bit already. Um, because it fouls by it, um, um, ones in which the present, past, and future are juxtaposed, and that's become almost a formula for certain kinds of writing now. A character who researches a past within the novel, for example, but more daring, uh, and to come back to Toni Morrison's work, especially Beloved, offers a history not quite as catastrophe, but as trauma, in which remembering and forgetting for African Americans are a consequence of slavery, not simply the imposition of hegemonic historical imagination. And I think Beloved is, is a groundbreaking watershed novel in that way, not only because it, because it reflects on, as someone said in an earlier session, I think said, it reflects on the making of history and how one makes it. And the ghost itself, to which many critics, particularly on the left, particularly more radical critics, objected, why wasn't this a realist social novel? Why introduce the supernatural, the gothic? Um, into what should be a, 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 hist a realist historical novel. And, and Morrison replied, I heard him in an interview um, with someone in Britain actually saying, well, you know, slavery itself is unbelievable <laughs> in some respects. So why should we, you know, at least as unbelievable as ghosts. Uh, and the ghost is the trace. It's the trace of that history in the present and what you do with it. It's the trace in the lives of the people in the novel. Um, in Seppi's life and the whole question of a novel which doesn't really get answered is what you do with that history, how it weighs on you. Uh, and by asking it of the past, Morrison asks it of the present. Now that seems to me an enormous, that like Seabold's writing, uh, which evokes in some ways, I'm not saying you know, this is the only kinds of writing there are. Um, I, I've enjoyed Laura Fisher's recent novel about slavery, Strange Fruit, I very much like uh, Andrea Levy's The Long Song in some ways. Um, but it, it's important to be able to read novels inter interrogatively, to be able to question and think about, for example, um, the ways in which the use of, 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 of a, a, a kind of um, demotic speech, for example, the slave speech, which we can't know, uh, how that influences how we read the consciousnesses and the subjectivities that are being constructed imaginatively in the novel. Uh, I think that's a minefield, and I think that's something, again, that Mantel touched on last night. You know, if you use the voices of the past, and all voices somehow, as James said, you can't really retrieve the voice of even a generation ago, absolutely. Uh, they all have a kind of impact on how you, the reader, are constructed, what kinds of desires and histories and you know, politics you give, and when, the sub when you make the subaltern speak, even if you are uh, ethnically, uh, in some ways, part of their genealogy, you are doing so, it, it's a kind of imperiled, but exciting and interesting thing to do, something that we should be talking about. So I suppose, I suppose what I, I want to enter a plea for is also for us to think a little bit more about the temporality that occurs with writing. Uh, again, we've talked about the way in which, in, which the visible, in which the distance between the novel and the present, between the historical moment and the present, is made visible in a historical novel. Uh, but I don't think there are just two poles here. I think there are several different mediations. So many novels, historical novels, are literary novels in which the, what they're troping on uh, is not so much history in, in its academic or popular form, but on other novels. Uh, and the novel itself, just like history, has become a particularly almost reified, I, I don't want to use the word iconic, but <coughs> celebrated form, the 19th century novel in particular at the moment, just like the historical fiction, uh, as if it contained all history. And I think one of the things that come out of, the, of, of what we're saying today is that it can't, and it doesn't, and it shouldn't, um, that we need to read our historical fiction and encourage our readers to do so in relation to many other genres and forms, including popular history, academic history, um, the visual, we haven't talked enough about the visual. So I think I'll just leave it there. It's a kind of, it's a kind of plea for a, a kind of politics of reading uh, and interpretation. Thank you.
I never have a great problem uh, with historical fiction, to be honest. And that's why I never really have much concern about the fact that history today should cover it, albeit with the caveat that it should only be the best historical novels, or ones that were of great interest. For the simple reason that I think that what the writer of historical fiction does um, at its best, at their best, is much the same as what a historian does anyway. And this is particularly true in the case of empathy. Um, one thing that particularly illustrates this fact is um, Asa Briggs, in his uh, memoirs of working at Bletchley as a very young man. Um, I always thought that Asa Briggs was employed at Bletchley as a code breaker. I thought he was one of these uh, very clever polymaths of a science bent who then became an historian. But he claims that not to be true. He may well have been uh, highly intelligent in science as, as, as good as he is in history. But he wasn't. He was employed along with others, quite specifically as a historian. And the reason he was employed as a historian is that he listened in to conversations with German soldiers in Yugoslavia. He was listening to his colleagues on the other side, also involved in intelligence. And what he was employed to do was to get to know those people who he never met. And he claims to have known them better than almost anyone he ever knew in his life, though he never physically met them. And what his job was to do was to decide what they would do next. And that, to a certain extent, is what someone like Hilary Mantel does with Thomas Cromwell. What would he do next? The fact that Lecture was so successful suggests that the historians employed there, through their training, could decide exactly what would happen next. And indeed, um, it is claimed that that's exactly what Briggs did. And so, in that sense, his writers of historical fiction are doing just that. But first of all, I should say that most historical fiction is, I think, tosh, which is controversial. Most of it, unfortunately, is not like Warhol or Ian Pierce's masterly and erudite An Instance of the Fingerprints. But in that, it differs from no other literary genre. <laughs> At its worst, and it piles up on my desk, it is along with Dams and Abbey Adele and Home Baking, part of what the Guardian has called today the inexorable rise of the new boring. <laughs> um, but, it's, but fiction has its place. Students going up to Cambridge to read English and history, the two subjects we're talking about today, two disciplines that come together here, are requested to make themselves familiar with certain works of historical fiction over the holidays before they begin their course. The plays of Shakespeare, of course, the King James Bible, without knowledge of which an understanding of British history before 1945, I would argue, is impossible. And more fiction than fact, arguably, Gibbon's rise and fall. It's a good grounding in works that, as Hilary Mantel pointed out last night, have the power to describe and invoke lost emotions. The gaps and inconsistencies prompt questions in the inquiry. The beauty the suppleness and the insight of the language is instructive in itself. Historical fiction benefits academic history, not least, because it often sparks the historical imagination before it is trained, before it is even aware that it's the historical imagination that is being cultivated. My first memory of actively thinking about history was prompted when I was about six or seven, and a teacher read a chapter of Leon Garfield's Jack at the end of each day. Always followed interestingly by um, the hymn, the singing of the hymn today, though gay this Lord has ended, which of course is, is itself um, a smidgen of, the, of historical um, consciousness with its, um, with its warning that all proud empires pass away. But Jack tells the story of an 18th century child pickpocket a novel peopled by hanging judges and hiring men, and with a strong current of class conflict. 
The bit that caught my imagination, and I can still remember it as though it was yesterday, is when Jack is taken into the bosom of a middle class family and he's bathed for the first time. He had simply acquired clothes, and before his pale skin appears, his clothing is peeled away layer after layer like some virgin salmon. What was his skin like, I thought? What did he smell like? Which is always the question, of course, that children ask, which we should always consider, I think, um, and which is one of the reasons why Suskin's perfume was such a success, I think, both commercially and as a work of art. I think it's also worth praising young Ian Mortimer's Time Traveller's Guide to Medieval England here. We've seen some brickbacks from historians, but I thought it was excellent in answering those questions. Um, about smell, about the emotions that we have there. And it was no surprise to me at all that it became the best thing. The answers, of course, are out there, but it was fiction that made me want to search out the facts. And I know from talking to professional historians, and this is made evident every year when I speak to uh, students at Royal Holloway's um, an MA in public history, that it was almost always historical fiction that enticed them onto the path of their future discipline. Rosemary Suckley's The Eagle of the Ninth is always mentioned, as is Ian Sorelius' The Silver Sword, Geoffrey Household's Road Mail is mm one, -hmm. Mary Renault and George MacDonald Fraser for the racist stuff, all the usual stuff, Robert Graves as well, who was an influence on me, not so much because of the book, but because of its visualisation on uh, on BBC, by Claudius, that is, um, which uh, didn't affect only my historical consciousness, I have to say. And it's also worth bearing in mind that fiction becomes historical fiction in a way. I think of the way I think of Conrad, for instance, who I, I, I know think of as historical fiction, or Dostoevsky, and all kinds of, and, and indeed it's a point that Amanda Bickery makes about Jane Austen as well. And indeed, the way that someone like Austin is perceived differently through each generation is itself an historical reason. Beyond youth, though, historical fiction is also a benefit to academic history, in that it points the way, and I said this last night, and it points the way to the cutting edge work in the history of emotions being done, practiced by the likes of John Arnold and Tom Dixon, and which is resonant in. in Previous historians, or still active historians, but, but ones who preceded them, such as Carl Ginsberg and Natalie Zeman Davis. And a lot of people have talked about W.G. Seabold um, this afternoon. I suppose the one who had the equivalent experience on me, and the novelist who reminded me of the otherness of the world and the otherness of the past and place, is Jorge Luis Borges who I think it deserves to be thought of as a historical writer of the highest order. It's why I think Wolf Hall is so important in the way it connected with this new emphasis in history on the emotions. In the sense that there have been many other conscientious writers of historical fiction, and we can see from what Hillary said, I was not just how conscientious <coughs> the figure she are, but she is conscientious about consciousness. Um, there are many other historical writers who are conscientious about fact. I think about Patrick O'Brien, for instance, and John McCallum, um, both of whose commitment to factual precision is very male and borders on the anal, indeed if it doesn't surpass it. But Hillary's conscientiousness is about consciousness. How did Cromwell think within a frame the facts of which, this is true in history after all, and it's well documented, we do, by and large, know. There can be no definite judgment, of course, as there is in history anyway, rank as any argument. But I found the portrait convincing, and it is worthy of consideration to be read with the scepticism which we should always approach history itself, real history, if you forgive me. And should be read alongside the works of Eric Arnold, Sterling, McCallum, Jack Scalesbury, Christopher Hayes, and all of those. The likes of Mantell, and I can think of others of, of that order, like Penelope Fitzgerald and Rose Tremaine, Shirley Hazard, 
do more than fill in gaps left by gossip and conspiracy. They offer us, whether writers of fiction or historians, a means of investigating thought and behaviour that the academic historian would be very foolish to ignore. Yet it is their writing skills, their mastery of communication, which is the greatest threat to academic historians, too many of whom pay far too little attention to this fundamental aspect of their work. I also want to say something about, we, we've concentrated on the novel here, but we are dealing with historical fiction here, and about the role of film. I think historical film has got a very bad name in the likes of those such films as Braveheart, for instance, and, and, and Hollywood films in general. Um, but I don't think that's always been the case. One of the great strengths of film is that it deals with another aspect of fiction, at its best that is, which is myth. I don't buy into the idea that myth is simply wrong history or false history or something. Uh, I, I think that, that is a, a traduction that, that just doesn't work for me. I think that myth is as much about aspiration as it is about false history. Uh, I'll give you an example if we look at well, two examples actually. If we look at the myth of Venice, for instance, which we think is an enabling fiction, it's a work of fiction produced over many generations that enabled, or helped to enable, a small city-state to become a major power in the Mediterranean. I think back to the myth of the Blitz in 1940 as well, which is another enabling myth. Not only one that allowed Britain to help Britain to survive when it was on its own in 1940, but also was very positive in that the sentiments and beliefs created by that myth also led to the foundation of the NHS and led indeed to the foundation of the Labour government, the great reforming Labour government of 1945. And I think that anyone who thinks that myths are all negative, their, their demonstration enough and suffice to make sure that that's absolutely not the case. And indeed, it might, it might uh, be worthy of consideration that the English need another myth to get them through the future. <laughs> Marcel Détien, the Belgian classicist, um, suggested in, in reference to um, Moses Finney's attempt to identify historical elements in the works of Homer. Sorry, actually, I, I should just mention one thing before I get on to Détien, and it's going back to this myth again, because part of the people who examined that myth that was put forward in cinema, and I think you know Powell and Pressburg, in such films which interrogated myths, such as A Matter of Life and Death and The Canterbury Tale, for example. And I think it's also done, this investigation of a nation's myth and the way it thinks about itself, in such a film, a real, a real masterpiece of historical meditation, which is, which is Tarkovsky's Mirror, and also perhaps his film Andrew Rublev as well, um, which are by their nature elusive and elusive in the way that cinema is a work of artist, but nevertheless are suggestive of often historical mindset, and I think they're worth examining again and again, the rich in their detail. They don't, so Akoski's Middle doesn't examine myth in the way that Powell and Pressburger's best films. It sort of encapsulates it in a way which is particularly relevant, I think, to someone who's outside that culture and it's instructive in that. But I'll go back to Detien, um, the Belgian classicist, who um, was talking about Moses Finley's attempts to identify historical elements in the works of Homer. And he pointed out that the elimination of the mystical element when writing history has been a penchant typical of historians. And I suppose it's something like the Mirror and the Canterbury Tale to bring back that mystical element to history, which I think is done. Might it be possible, as Carlo Ginsberg has suggested, in turn, to build the truth on fiction and true history on the fictitious. After all, such a task is part of an ancient tradition. Thucydides, going back to the very beginning of history, tried to reconstruct the dimensions of ancient Greek vessels from Homer's ship catalog in the Iliad. And I think it's worth a try because detached superiority has its thoughts too.
very last speaker, it's been quite a long day, and um, we've gone round, um, round the mention of the historical novel, I think, several times. Um, I really just want to say thank you for, uh, to Cora for um, making me remember, and I felt somewhat oppressed as a practitioner um, throughout the day by the varieties of taxonomy and the analysis of the craft, um, which I tried to uh, learn and practice. That one really good reason for the historical novel is that the sex is better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and possible. Um, and that the costume drama makes it so to some degree. And I also think that there's, there is also um, uh, a more serious point to that, which, which um, is something I'll come on to um, later, which is that, it, that perhaps one um, justification and pleasure of the historical novel is it has provided a space to write about things which aren't possible either in life or in the contemporary novel. So if you think about what's happened to sex and the writing about desire in the contemporary novel, it seems to have got smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're, we're really all reading Freedom um, earlier this year, was it last year, earlier this year? Um, you know, you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and it actually is absolutely nothing, you know, almost nothing there. So sex is within a way, I think, in the contemporary <laughs> novel. The more, but, but alongside that, I think that um, the historical novel also has uh, um, a space, really, for writing about love stories, writing about love in a way that perhaps it's also become quite difficult in the very self-conscious space that is now um, the historical novel. So um, thank you very much for that. This is what you know, maybe there's one good reason for keeping at it. <laughs> um, so I want really just to do two things, one of which is to talk in a little while about the, the way in which, uh, what space the historical novel um, occupies, um, what kind of sociological function um, does it have, and I'll, I'll refer again to Perry Anderson's um, uh, article on the historical novel in the Nudge Review of Books of July of this year, um, because although flawed and attacked by, um, from all sides, it was actually a really brave attempt to write some kind of theoretical, sociological, politicised um, construction of what the historical novel is as a thing. Um, so I'll come back to that. The other, but, but, but um, I just wanted to again go back to some of the things that Hilary Mantel was saying yesterday, and something that I've been thinking about through the day. Um, I think about you know, when is the historical novel, um, you know, uh, when is the, a novel not a historical novel? When is the historical novel something else? When, it is when is it just a novel? <coughs> Um, and I think that gets us onto the side, thinking about literature, which is where I come in, um, as someone who was not a, um, an academic historian, was never trained as a historian, um, but was trained in uh, literature, and always have thought of what I do as um, you know, writing stories, really. And so I've come actually from the world of um, literature and biography into, as a kind of interloper, really, into the world of history. So. Um, I sit among you as something of a fraud, I suppose. Um, but um, when I think about you know, what claims that Hilary Mantel was making um, for her book, in, in a way quite astonishing, I think, um, yesterday. Um, and um, uh, you know, she, she said eloquently, beautifully, um, she, she claimed the historical fiction fills the gap and the erasures of history. And she described herself as mapping the unknown territory and use the word resurrection of figures in the past who have no archival presence, and that she would find them in the interstices of the written record, and like the Pied Piper, really, draw them forth for the wonder and delight of her readers. You know, there's Thomas Cromwell as to the life, or you know, I saw Thomas Cromwell playing, as Browning you know, might have put it. But what is that claim? I mean, it's a claim, really, I suppose, in which we hear the echoes, the great echoes, the great Michelet, in the, in the archives, um, listening to the voices of the dead and kind of, you know, the, the idea of coaxing the dead out of the historical record, <coughs> even out of the gaps, where, out of nothing, out of nowhere, um, out of where they are not, into um, our presence. Um, and the dead who long to speak to us, who've been forgotten or unimagined, imprisoned by paper, or actually even unfound, <coughs> never put there in the first place. Um, so the claim is really a great one. It's that the historical novelist has the gift of imagination 
and the freedom conferred by the genre to use that imagination alongside all the kinds of research we're talking about today and, and um, that are available to her, but to, 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 to see better, to go further, and really to do what historians cannot, which is, which is at, at, on the one hand, to pull the dead out of the past, and on the other hand, to take the reader um, through into you know, the real visceral presence of in historical time, and perhaps to have them meet somewhere um, in a fictive realm in the middle. So the dead come out to us, and we go uh, um, into them. I do know the seductions of um, that sensation uh, myself, and, and also the demands, perhaps uh, the police upon the historical novelist now, by the demands of the information age and the plethora of wonderful research which are provided to the novelist by the social historian from the 60s and 70s onwards. There's a kind of tyranny in a certain way um, of uh, um, the factual, the desire to get it all right, and perhaps that is, it becomes elevated into a kind of mystical idea that the, that the novelist can go further than the historian and see more truly and actually be the better historian than the academic historian. And that, that was, to some degree, the claim um, that we heard. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's, I do think that it's, it's beautiful, poetic, uh, desirable, though sometimes it, 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 was, it is a shiver, and it's also nonsense. I mean, it's also nonsense. What makes Hilary Mantel a great historical novelist is actually not, a, I don't think, that she has provided us with a convincing um, uh, or uh, the, the ghostly um, presence of Thomas Cromwell has risen up and come towards us, that we have gone towards it, or that it is convincing, that it is plausible, that it is true. None of those things, actually, is what makes Wolf Hall a great novel, or makes other examples of historical novels great novels. What makes them great novels is that she's a great novelist. And I, so I want to put that kind of side to our day, really, which is actually to think about you know, what are the qualities, the writing qualities that make for a great historical novel. And I don't, I mean, on the whole, I don't think it is the history. Um, we, we may gather all that up. We may, you know, we may, we may um, like Michel in the archive, um, you know, eating, the, eating history, eating and imbibing and, and breathing in the dust. We may get um, some, of, some of those sensations. Um, but it, it's, I think that the really important point about the great historical novel it is not history, it is itself. Uh, its writing does not serve history. Uh, it's, if, it, if it serves a muse at all, it is probably the muse of poetry. So, but I think the novel is its own master. So I, and I don't believe Henry Mantel is successful because of the plausibility of events. Um, or the accuracy of, well, she didn't claim accuracy of language, but, but for those who, who, might, who might do, all that she fills in the gaps and erases, is because she creates a coherent and pleasurable linguistic world that conjures up a particular physical environment that she has imagined. Um, so we enjoy the novel by Wolf Hall, actually sentence by sentence, um, for the, you know, the glories of its language. Um, and not because it convinces us that Thomas Cromwell is a cosmopolitan, cultured, and charming uh, man. Great history could do that job. Um, I think by the same token, uh, if we think of other great examples, from, either from, the, from the taxonomy that Perry Anderson gives, of the classic historical novel, um, or, or others, uh, we can see that there are other qualities at play that elevate the historical novel into the category of a novel. Um, and so, you know, Tolstoy is no, is no stylist. Um, we don't read him for his historical music. In fact, most of the time, when you read War and Peace, you miss all those bits out. Certainly, I didn't come to reading his bits about history um, until, you know, you know, I was in my 40s and I was reading the book for the fourth, um, but probably the fourth time. Um, you know, I read Tolstoy as a great you know, soap opera with you know, grand themes attached. Um, and for the reason that Tolstoy endures, which is that he is probably more than any other writer, um, he is able to conjure up and split open and present to us a uh, whole personality using a single word, and he can reveal to us the essential frailty and vulnerability um, of the human spirit and condition by a single phrase. 
Um, so he has actually, therefore, perhaps what more than any other novelist, what Henry James defines as the essence of literature, the power to guess the unseen from the seen, to use physical de details and language to, as it were, make us see um, the human soul. And I think it's that that's the greatness um, of War and Peace. So language, um, the psychological acuteness of the beginning and the ability to transmit that. And I think a third component um, in which will e elevate the historical novel into the category of novel is the exposition of a particular idea or a set of ideas um, that, that that turn a costume drama into um, an exploration of that, usually obviously a political one. Um, if we think of, in this context, if we think of the work of J.G. Farrell, who I think Peter Strauss talk, probably talked about already today, um, work that is produced uh, towards the end of the Vietnam War and against the background of what historians would call decolonization, we see immediately that what lifts his trilogy into the realm of literature, and apart from, apart from the, the tremendous humour, and his ability as a writer to sustain a long comic scene, which is a tremendous uh, skill, what lifts it really is, is um, that he is examining um, a particular idea that was pertinent for his own time and continues to be pertinent for hours. Um, that, um, and, that, and that idea that he, is, um, that, that, that he is examining in his Empire Trilogy is the psychological springs of imperialism. And precedently for his day, it was to examine the forms of masculinity that um, produced it. I mean, just as well, because if you read um, Farrell's Letters and Diaries that were published uh, last year, you see that Farrell is someone, um, you see the limitations of Farrell, perhaps what would have been the limitations of his writing had he lived, which is that Farrell is, as a, as a, as a letter writer, we can say, and as a diarist, uh, probably, um, as a man, he has, he has uh, his attitudes to women and his interest in women is um, fairly compromised, I would say. And when you see, when you look at the novels, you can see um, that the women take very, very minor and usually comic parts, which is absolutely fine. He's writing about masculinity. That's the job that he set himself. And he does it superbly and precisely <coughs> because actually historians at, the, at that time hadn't got on um, in the, the early 1970s they have actually started to examine, um, the, uh, as far as I know, the relationship, um, the psychological relationship between masculinity um, and, and empire. And that's what Farrell does um, so beautifully. And Farrell, actually, interestingly, is not a writer who's very interested in, um, the, the, in historical accuracy. I mean, his books are full of absurdity. And the way in which he gets across um, the power of his themes is mostly through symbolism. It's not through the piling on of, 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 uh, of um, researched historical fact. Um, if, if you remember in Troubles, the way in which he um, impresses on us the, uh, the crumbling of empire and the um, increasing uh, nationalism and uh, coherence of, uh, of uh, the revolutionary movement in the, in the Troubles is by his image of the ivy which begins to um, seep, grow into, and destroy the fabric of the majestic hotel. And all through the book, the ivy gets greener and greener and thicker and thicker and starts coming up through the floor and down through the ceilings. And, um, and uh, in the siege of Krishna Poor, he, um, he has absurd um, details. So that, for instance, they have the, I think it's the collector, he gets out of the catalogue of the Great Exhibition a whole series of um, objects which are there in Krishnapur, um, along with, the, with the, the fantastic busts of Shakespeare, Milton, I can't remember, canonical figures, which all, of course, get thrown um, towards the attacks or used to try and kind of prop up the walls as this image of you know, the, the, the British uh, mentality of empire comes under siege from those figures that you never see in this brilliant kind of version of Orientalism, you never see the attackers. They're coming towards the fortress, but they never ever actually appear, because of course they are in the minds of um, the defenders. Uh, but one of the things that the collector has is um, a train that rolls out its own track, and then as it goes along, it, uh, it, it collects it um, at the, at the, uh, from, the other, from the other end. So they're absurd. Um, uh, 
an emphasis on the idea of, pro of, the, of progress or to, taking to an absurd extreme symbols of progress, which of course were all going to, to crumble and turn into mud uh, in the destruction of uh, Krishna Poor. Um, so I think that's that, that, that um, I wanted really just to say that, that um, I think it's those things that, that we need to um, think about um, psychological acuteness the power of language and the coherence of certain set of ideas which will create a great historical novel and thereby elevate it really out of costume drama and into um, a realm where we can just call it a novel. It doesn't matter what it's written about, what period it's set in, um, or when it's written. Um, that, those will be its enduring um, things. Um, I'll just turn very briefly then to um, something else which I think has come out of this day which is quite interesting and also seems to me quite pertinent and important because it kind of puts a check for me on um, uh, the value of the enterprise, thinking about it and how we should think about it, which is that one of the things that Perry Anderson highlights in what he calls, I think, the post-modern post period of the historical novel is that novelists have used the past as to, to, to reinvent it, to imagine into it. Uh, and what um, historical novelists are imagining into it, and actually I think it's something that they've always done, it's not a postmodern country particularly, is to, is to either imagine away th uh, things that, that, that have been terrible in the historical record, or potentially, more positively, to imagine forward to something good, uh, a better state of affairs. So that if you think of uh, historical novels written by men, there are an awful lot of them, which are, from more Dartha onwards, which are about chivalry, they are about idealised forms of masculinity, they are, are um, chivalrous forms of warfare. It's a theme that is very common throughout um, the, the, the historical novel. Um, and in the present, uh, in, in the recent past, you can think of all Bridge Victorian, you can think of sharp, um, innumerable examples. And they are, in a way, I suppose, idealised versions of masculinity which, which make men feel better, perhaps about the things that they've really done, um, and the way that war really is. And similarly, what we see in the modern historical novel um, writing about women is that women, time and time again, women historical novelists return to the sites of female power. So they return to the court, they, they return to the nunnery, and they return to the house of the highly placed courtesan. And there are those three historical, major historical sites where women could have power in the past, and they proved irresistible um, to um, historical novelists. And I think that is the reason, actually, why the Tudors and, med and medieval um, uh, um, queens are so um, continually popular, not only for to be written about, but also to be read about. It's a place where women could actually do stuff. Um, and, um, where sexual power could actually operate, or, or could it, I suppose, is the question. Um, is it, in fact, is it um, the, the case that going back to the sites of female power is actually an imagining of a, a way of not thinking about the present and not thinking about the future? Is it the case that the historical novel, um, especially written by women, but also, if you like, the chivalrous version written by men, has, is, is in part a, a kind of burying of the head. And it's a place where you're going to feel better because actually you don't have those forms of power in the present. Um, and, and therefore, is it then a kind of break on radical feminist writing activity and um, an essentially conservative activity that we ought to think quite hard about before we engage in? Or is it, as it's been put to me on, on the counter case, or is it a positive way to imagine a better future? Is it, in other words, a place you, you, you went as an adolescent, as a modern reader, um, where things are, you know, things are particularly bad, you look around and, and, and the world is, is, is bleak from, uh, from a gender point of view or a political point of view, and there you can inhabit or create a space where things can be better, and therefore you're then projecting onto the present and potentially onto the future some kind of um, analogy of hope. Um, so now I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. Thank you very much, Alexia. You've heard four excellent, provocative, thought-provoking and deep 
and the contributions. And in fact, I think it, I think it validates, Jamie, validates this, the whole day, because I think the whole room has moved a bit um, from 24 hours ago. And, and all the voices have contributed to that. Um, there are the, if I just point to a few, a few themes, uh, uh, overall, we're saying that, um, in a sense, does the success of historical fiction benefit or threaten academic history? It isn't really the question. That, that, that fiction, uh, historical fiction, may be or may not be what it thinks it is, but that doesn't matter if it's good, that's okay. Um, we've broadened up the whole the concept, we've, we've set it uh, within the, uh, the, the mix of uh, popular history, serious history, academic history, um, and fiction, and what they do in their different ways, and the important thing is that they're good at what they do. Um, we have thought about um, Sex and nonsense and trash, but those are all okay too. Um, there are various themes that I think we, we picked up at and picked up on in this, this last segment. And I wondered if there are any reactions uh, from the hall, particularly about the, the speakers here. I said. Um, the two hands at the bottom, sorry, the, the one in the two hands right at the back and the one in the front. Everyone's looking behind, sorry. <laughs> Um, there, there, there's, um, yeah, with, with, with the red and the black. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, I really like to be able to believe every one of the panelists that there is no threat posed um, by historical fiction, because I, I really like that the way the world should be, but um, I can't shake the concern, so I'm hoping you can help me a little bit with that. And that is that we. Throughout the last day and a half, we've conceived of historical fiction on sort of one end of a fluid spectrum. Um, and we've acknowledged that for the historical novelists, they have to sell a product. Um, that what they do is, is subject to the demands of the market. They have to please people. They have to please the reader. They have to please their editor, their publisher, and so on. Um, and on the other end of this spectrum, we have a sort of more academic history. Um, which has come under threat to this sort of supply and demand consumer culture. And that we'd like to, I think most of us, protect from that. We don't want our research dictated by popular demand, um, by a sort of larger majority, by government or market forces or anything. And I just, I just wonder if having this sort of fluid spectrum between the two, and you can say that popular history maybe is somewhere in between, um, just opening up academic history to these sorts of, of genres and, and ways of writing, open it up to these consumer market forces um, that we really like to protect it from. Thank you. Uh, I mean, that's a comment in the sense rather than a question. Speaking as an academic publisher, I will reassure you it's not all about the seconds. Um, more the pity. Um, does anyone want to come in on that? Well, I would say as an outsider, I'm not an academic historian, and, and, um, and neither am I trained in, in, uh, in history, um, that actually um, you know, the professional world um, is perfectly able to take care of itself and the world to sail on, um, uh, you know, talking to itself as it, as it does, and those who, want to, who, who wish to have the capacity um, to talk uh, beyond that will also continue to do so. I, I, don't, I don't actually... Um, I don't perceive the threat um, as you do, um, because uh, because um, I think if there is a, if there is a threat from the, the, the forces that you describe, um, then it's up to academic historians to gird themselves and defend themselves from it. Um, those of us who are you know, on the other side of um, that space have have you know, absolutely no intention or desire. Um, to, to threaten the very important work um, at, for which I have absolutely every respect that academic historians um, do. So I would say it's your job to get out there and, and you know, make your demarcation line, mount your barricade, and actually um, don't sit there passively in front of it, but, you know, um, and fear that there are the forces coming at you. Go out and, um, and, and tell the world what you're doing, tell them why it's important, and get on doing it. There was a question behind, yes. Um, I wanted to raise a question that's been sort of in the air all day or a subject that's 
draper and the question of passivity in the queue for the Bendy's bathroom, which is the question of nationalism. Uh, because the modern historical novel has its roots in the 19th century as a child of romantic nationalism and realism. And I'm just wondering whether part of the revival of the historical novel now has to do with a kind of national anxiety, and an anxiety about that imagined community that it helped to create in the 19th century. And that whether by addressing those things in the form of fiction rather than history, we're putting them in kind of in the safety of inverted commas so that we don't have to appear to be uh, sort of straight empiricists but can protect uh, protect the, the stories that we're telling with that fictionality. Well, I want to sort of come back and we'll go with that. If I, I want to answer it in a slightly roundabout way, which, you know, which certainly I think it is responding to that anxiety, but maybe not in the kind of straightforwardly, a straightforwardly conservative way. Um, it, 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 I think fiction is a space, but it's not that protected a space. If we argue um, with Benedict Anderson that the novel helps to construct the nation, uh, I certainly think that you know, in terms of the novel, and I'm not sure that the historical novel at the moment isn't had, doesn't have a higher reputation in literary terms than the novel itself. But that the, that the novel, you know, does, we get the novels we deserve. We get Saturday if we're, if we're unlucky <laughs> as a contemporary, it's a very conservative contemporary novel. But we also get the kind of novel um, which queries the question of the nation. And what I would want to point to is an, uh, uh, an author we haven't discussed today, Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, and I would want to argue that, that um, Never Let Me Go is as much a historical novel um, which asks us to, um, which invents a history. And we've already talked about how a historical novel can invent uh, a, a kind of magical history, a disastrous history, a history um, that, um, that, that Jameson and Benjamin would think of as a form of catastrophe and violence. Uh, but it's also read back into the 70s, something that we, you know, we, we made in, and, and then it's as much, it's as much concerned with those, that history read back and forward as something like Remains of the Day. Now neither of these are very upbeat novels, but I think the utopian element of what fiction can do and, it, and what, it, what its critique can do is not embedded in the kind of positive upbeat ending of the novel, but in the relationship between its reading, its writing and its reading uh, in a particular moment. Uh, and I think I think one of the things that that, that the the pass, the seeming passivity of the heroine, uh, uh, the protagonist of Never Let Me Go, which so offended so many writers, the flat voice uh, of this ordinary non-human person, or almost human non-human person, uh, was is part of you know is is a way of getting at something about uh, the nationalizing moment, its nostalgia, its reconception of itself, its protection of itself uh, in particular ways through fiction. So I think the historical novel, can, you know, it doesn't have a single politics. It can do all these different things, but it can never do it by itself on its own. It's always a practice that has, a, you know, that, that, that's, that is both private, the reader, the, the writer, and, and also collaborative, collective. Uh, in relational in some ways. Does that, is that, does that sort of move toward the question in some ways? Yeah. There was another hand up. Uh, <laughs> I guess on, on opening up the idea of, you know, the definition of historical novel, um, the language for the sort of, um, if you're taking in, it's more about the connection between us and what's happening in the book and sort of the writing of the novel. I guess, how would you sort of connect that with the idea of fantastical histories, like the hoax ones, or things like that, where, in fact, nothing in the book is actually historically accurate, but it is written as a historical novel, either sort of ones that are, you know, fantastical histories, or ones that are future histories, but are still written in sort of that same style as a history. And I guess, have you seen some ones like that, or what would you expect with that type of idea? Have you got an example of that? Um, I mean, there's, there's ones, I and mean, like my first thought is actually um, one where it's a sort of rewriting of history. Um, uh, there's one, uh, the Doomsday Book uh, by Connie Willis, where it's future, but they've been able to go back in time and change things. 
um, or even sort of things like some of the you know our robots of modern uh, ones sort of futurist histories uh, that you'll get. Um, I'm trying to think. I can have to meet immediately get one of those. Sorry. Um, Anyone want to say anything? On that? Probably not. Well, they're so fantastical that I, I find it hard to think of them of history at all. So I would have a, um, a problem with that. Um, I just wanted to go back to something that Stella said, which, which I think is, is, is absolutely right about this, and, and, I, <coughs> and something about nostalgia as well, which I think is always a danger with history, whether it's real history or historical fiction. Um, and to get back to this, is the importance of rhetoric. Um, we Stella mentioned that, that Hillary is just not a fine um, historical novelist, but just a fine novelist, and we should judge her as that. And to a certain extent, I'm very sympathetic with that. But it's, it does, if we turn that on its head, there's also the power of rhetoric for historians. And this is why the ability to argue one's case is so important. I think back to, say, someone who was a very fine stylist, and an eccentric historian, that's someone like A.J.P. Taylor, who, because of the power of his rhetoric, could argue quite preposterous uh, <laughs> theses. And so we should never forget about the power of rhetoric there, whether it's in the historical novel or whether it's in, it's in academic history. Well, of course, it, I think it's true that the really uh, the enduring works, the great enduring works of history, have some of the same qualities. They have the ability to, to marshal, to create a plot, essentially, um, to use great language, um, uh, and to, you know, to, to, to drive uh, a series of uh, important ideas through those things. Yeah. Well, we're also touching on the power of history to distort and to create myths, and quite powerful, dangerous myths, by erasing part of the historical record as well. And history can be a very, very powerful tool of governments. And uh, Jane, we are sort of moving towards a wrap-up here, and I, and I know you want to have one. So before that starts, I just want to say a very warm thank you to the participants of this. It's been really good.